Hi, I'm Dr. Lori at the PhD Antiques Appraiser, and today I'm going to talk with you about souvenir shopping when you travel. A lot of pieces that are collected relate to places where we go. You know, uh, what this first started out with was something called curiosities. This is how we got the term for curio cabinets and curiosity shops. It was if you went somewhere and you were curious about a place and you would bas basically bring something back, it would start a conversation in your home when you got back home and it was a curiosity or a curious thing from another place. So let's talk about souvenirs. That's how we actually got to this idea. So souvenirs, a lot of different things that I look for when I'm looking for souvenirs. A lot of these things that you will see are going to show up at thrift stores, at yard sales and such. And souvenirs tend to be some of the things that actually get placed onto a yard sale table or donated to a thrift store. So a couple of things I want you to look for. Sometimes they can be valuable if they are of good quality. So don't just discount them just because they're unfamiliar to you. Get familiar. You know, best way to get familiar is to travel, but get familiar with some of these pieces. So I want to talk to you about what I look for. So this, I'm going to start right here with this Middle Eastern necklace. This particular necklace is a Middle Eastern example, and it's a nice piece. It has, it's called multimedia. When you hear that particular term, multimedia, you're going to see a lot of different types of um, elements. So different pieces all put together. So there's some metal work here. There's some, of course, um, beads here. There's some glass. There's some stones, all different types of things. And you're going to see it with this sort of rondelle at the bottom. So what do I look for? I look for quality in certain parts of the piece. So I look for a nice clasp, a nice, good, strong clasp that's going to hold the piece together. Right? So I look for that, like a nice strong clasp. I also look for strength in areas like this, where the chain's going to meet the pendant. Where the chain meets the pendant, I want you to actually look for that kind of strength. So a nice round bale here. Also look at the different colors of, of course, the stones. And some of the stones are your traditional turquoise. Some of the stones are tiger's eye. Some of the stones are like an amethyst color. And then it's on a, a base metal that has a silver tone. So it's not sterling silver. It's not, of course, high silver, but it is in fact, or high quality silver, but it is in fact a nice silver tone. And I want you to remember, if you don't remember, to bring a loop with you. Bring the loop, because the loop will actually help you to identify what you've got. So you can see the piece and make sure that you're looking at stones and maybe not just poured in glass or poured in plastic on these pieces. So that's a pretty valuable piece. Comes from the Middle East, made with, of course, local stones and inset. The beads here, of course, are also um, a silver, but a low quality silver, not very high purity level of the silver. Value on that piece about $100. But it's a nice keepsake. A lot of people will go abroad or people will go on a vacation or go on a trip somewhere and they'll bring back jewelry. Jewelry holds its value pretty well. A couple of other things, a couple of other places that are really well known for particular things. I always say that when you are souvenir shopping, make sure that you buy things that represent the place. So for example, a place like Italy, like Murano and Burano and of course Venice. So. Venice is known for, of course, the glass making center of Venice and the glass making center uh, and the, those wonderful furnaces that have been blowing glass with the artisans since the 1200s AD. So all the way back. Venice is very well known for the beautiful Grand Canal, but also known for, of course, glass making. So whether it's Murano, those great traditional Murano vases and Murano figural glass pieces of art glass that are hand blown, or pieces that you can pick up for just a couple of bucks to, tr to remember your time in that glass making center, like these pieces, which are bracelets. They are beaded bracelets and they are sold on the street for like $10, $12. And they're very, very inexpensive in places like Venice where you can pick these particular pieces up and you can see all the different colored, actually millefiori, millefiori, which is the idea of a thousand flowers and millefiori, a thousand flowers, all different colored bracelets. And they make them into beads and they make them into chains for your neck or they make them into necklaces or bracelets or even a little a ring here and there. But different types and they have different color schemes and they're really quite nice as you see them. They're usually on a relatively inexpensive sort of stretch or an elastic that goes right on your wrist. So make sure you're watching yourself uh, of course when you're at the you know eating at Daniele or something uh, the very famous restaurant in Venice make sure that you don't lose all the beads because sometimes the strings are kind of inexpensive 
So think about that. The other thing that you're going to see with respect to Murano is, of course, these kinds of pieces, which are also Millefiori. And these, of course, pieces are, I'm going to get one that's a red color, be a little easier for you to see. But these pieces, which are pendants in the form of crosses. You're going to see a lot of churches if you go to Italy. You're going to see a lot about the Pope if you go to Italy. And Italy, of course, has that tradition of the Roman, of Roman Catholicism, so you're going to see a lot of crosses too. So this is, of course, a very typical collectible that a lot of people collect from Murano, the glass blowing center of, of course, this art glass with the rods and, of course, the flower forms. If you look on this side, on the other side, you can see that it's a base of red and this is what I look for. It's a base of red glass that's into a mold. And then on top of that base of red, they actually will put the multicolored millefiore inside. And that's the same if you have a green example, you know, the base of green. And then on the other side, you're going to also see, just like with the red one, you're going to also see, of course, the millefiore and more green on the other side. So it's a good way for you to tell whether or not you have a good piece of Murano. They're done in a mold. They're pretty popular. And a lot of people will collect them. They're usually, as I said, about $10 a piece. Sometimes you're going to have some of the gold inside the Murano. What does that mean? A pendant like this pendant will actually show you a little bit of the gold or the gilt work that's inside. So it's still molded glass and a pendant like this might be somewhere around 50 to $90 just for the pendant just because of the gold inside. But this is another piece of Murano jewelry in this particular case. The other place that you'll see if you're in Venice is in fact a place called Burano. And Burano has these beautiful pastel colored buildings, all shops, the great lace making center of, of course, Venice. So another beautiful place to kind of travel and, and shop and stroll. I love to stroll and people watch when I'm in Italy. So those are a couple of ideas that I want you to think about. While you're in Europe, you want to get those things that are, relate to history, right? So if you're in Rome, you want maybe you want to get a, a souvenir uh, of the Pope, right? Maybe a Pope perfume bottle or maybe a souvenir that relates to Michelangelo's David if you're in Florence or maybe a souvenir of the Colosseum, right? So those kinds of things, those great, great landmarks that you're going to think about and see as you travel. Historical places and historical places that have changed over time will also be important. One of them is, of course, Berlin and the Berlin Wall. Being in Berlin and seeing the fragments of the Berlin Wall, which of course came down in the late, eight, in the late 80s and then of course was uh, completely, uh, completely left only in 1991, those portions of it are left there, but you could actually buy a piece of the Berlin Wall. And you've seen this it. kind of kitschy, you know, it's kind of like, oh, well, you can get a piece of the Berlin Wall while you're in Berlin, you know, usually they're about five euro. They're a little bit expensive for getting just a piece of a rock wall, but it really is a piece of history. And everybody, of course, uh, sells them on the street. If you're near the Brandenburg Gate, you, of course, can get them very easily. And a lot of people will, if they're in places like Germany, maybe in Munich, maybe they want to get something that relates to, of course, um, Munich and the, the idea of the pretzels, right? Or the idea of, of course, Munich being the place for Oktoberfest. I had a good time in Munich. Munich was fun. <laughs> and I do remember everyone in the hotel going, Morgan, Morgan, Morgan. <laughs> so you can pick up the language pretty easily until you have to actually make sentences. But if you know one or two words in German, you'll be okay. Um, I was not very good in German at all. Actually, I'm pretty bad at speaking German. Uh, but the Berlin Wall was kind of a cool thing. And then, of course, things like snow globes. Snow globes are that kitschy kind of collectible you can find in every airport. I'm not big on kitschy collectibles. I like a collectible that has some quality, that has some meaning, that relates to history, but sometimes you just got to get, you know, a beer stein collectible with a, that's a snow globe with a pretzel inside. You know how it is. So actually under five bucks for that particular piece too. We'll move that over here a little bit. So the Berlin Wall is an interesting thing to say you have a piece of the Berlin Wall because it's so historic. So that's a pretty cool thing, I think, in terms of collectibles. Other types of collectibles and other kinds of pieces that become collectibles that are really just souvenirs. When you're shopping, what else do I look for? I look for those things that relate to culture. So for example, I'm wearing a worry doll here pin. And in Guatemala, you would actually get a worry doll. And worry dolls will come in a pack like this. They'll come in a whole group of worry dolls, so a whole bunch of them, just textile dolls with little faces, little, 
you know, embroidered in eyes and mouths um, with their little hair bands. And worry dolls come in all different areas. And the idea is for you to actually take one and either pin it to yourself or hold it in your pocket or put it in your purse. And then, in fact, look at those worry dolls and let, your wor let the dolls worry for you. So the dolls actually will do all of the worrying. You won't have to worry because what you're worried about will become the problem of the doll. This is something very typical, of course, of Spanish culture and Spanish colonial culture, particularly in Guatemala, Panama, and other places. So it comes from the Spanish tradition, but it actually is highlighted in places like Guatemala. So these particular worry, worry dolls, sometimes you'll see them as necklaces, and sometimes they're, they're similar to milagros. You probably heard that term, milagros, that term, which, of course, has to do with the tradition of having, if you have an ailment, maybe you have a milagros or a little charm in the form of, you know, a leg if your knee hurts, this kind of thing. So similar type of thing, only these are related to worrying and something that's troubling you. So you have that kind of thing. Interesting, too. Then there are places like Turkey, Ephesus, Turkey. Um, you may have heard of the great, of course, uh, city of Ephesus. Ephesus where St. Paul made, of course, his famous, in the theater there at Ephesus, made his famous um, get, uh, presentations, his letters to, of course, the Ephesians. Ephesus was also the home of the Virgin Mary. It was said that in her old age that, in fact, St. John the Baptist had brought the Virgin Mary to Ephesus. And there's a home that is believed to be the Virgin Mary's home. And at that site, you can actually buy um, rosary beads. My family always had a lot of rosary beads around. We were brought up Catholic. And in fact, um, rosary beads like these, these were actually from the home of the Virgin Mary in Ephesus, Turkey. Ephesus is a wonderful example, of course, of um, a, a retained home, a retained town. Um, and that particular town, I've lectured there and I've given tours there many, many times. And that's a beautiful and wonderful place. And the home of the Virgin Mary is really exciting because you can actually see uh, what a home of that time period actually looked like, how it's been preserved. And right outside there are folks who are actually are selling things like the rosary beads. Um, the rosary beads are pretty typical. A lot of people will collect rosary beads and actually bring them home as souvenirs. I oftentimes when I'm looking for rosary beads, I either look for the ones that are actually um, beaded in with glass or maybe they're wooden beads and they're very commonplace souvenirs that you can bring back from places like Israel or Jerusalem or Ephesus. Um, also at um, the home of St. Mary's, there's a big wall, and that big wall, you place a piece of paper with your wish on it, and you place your wish next to everyone else's on the wall. So people, when I was there, were like grabbing tissues and trying to write on a tissue because they didn't have paper, little slips of paper, and then they would just tie it and put it on the wall. It was pretty wonderful, beautiful place. Other places that are beautiful are places that, of course, highlight the beaches, right? So lovely places, uh, islands are always good for vacation. And some of the places that relate to, of course, the islands or the Caribbean, and the Caribbean um, places in the Caribbean like St. Martin. St. Martin is a wonderful place, and it's interesting. And it's interesting because it has a French side and a Dutch side. So the Dutch side, uh, and this island is shared by the two, of course, um, by the two countries, by the French and also by the Dutch. And the Dutch side really highlights the Dutch tradition, not only of clogs, but also of Delft, ceramics, Delft blue and white Delft ceramics. And this example, actually, they don't come from the Netherlands. They come from St. Martin. And St. Martin is showing you that they actually have that. The red, white, and blue um, little ribbon here relates to the red, white, and blue of their counterpart or the French side because the red, white, and blue is of the French flag. So kind of neat. Little ceramic knickknacks for the curio cabinet. Those are valued probably a couple of dollars, not too much. As you're going other places, I want you to head from, of course, the, the, the wonderful islands north and north to places like Canada. And Canada will be very well known in places like Victoria and Vancouver and that area of Canada, right, the British Columbia. You might find some of the most popular people like, of course, the Canadian Mounted Police, they look like this, and also moose are big there too. So you're gonna see a lot of this kind of image there. So just because it looks like, of course, the Mounted Police, he's kind of a fun collectible, but what really would be valuable wouldn't be so much um, the Mounties, 
with their hat and their traditional boots, right, um, on horseback or mooseback. You also would look for Inuit or basically what is first people or indigenous people sculptures, like this particular one. This one which has a mark on it that indicates an Inuit piece, which is from Canada and distributed in Canada, but in fact made by the indigenous people, a direct carving of a particular bird in, uh, in stone, really quite nice as well. So sculpture and artwork is oftentimes some of the most desirable types of things. It's fun to have cheapy pieces like, you know, maybe one of the red masks from Sapporo, Japan, or maybe a little geisha girl from Sapporo, Japan, but it might be best if you were to, in fact, um, think about the collectible from the Kabuki Theater, like a Japanese woodblock print of one of the actors in the Kabuki Theater. But if you are in Sapporo in the northern part of Japan, maybe you're thinking about bringing home one of those famous red masks of the guys with the big, you know, with the big noses. They're very, very typical there in, in fact, Sapporo. So interestingly enough, you can see those pieces. You can see them oftentimes in these places. Um, a lot of other pieces that you can see and you can look for are pieces that have high quality. So if you're looking for, oh, I want to bring home the painting for over the fireplace, right, from my trip, you want to make sure that you're thinking about the budget and thinking about if it will get there safely. And you want to think about also what's quality in that place. So what's important in that place will relate to the quality of that place. Always remember to collect things that relate to history of a particular travel site or landmark, and always make sure that you are looking at pieces that relate to culture too. I'm Dr. Lori, a little couple of tips about, of course, souvenir shopping. Don't forget to travel far and wide. It'll enhance your mind.